You're listening to the Morning Drive Podcast from Lubbock Sports Station, Double T 97.3, recapping the night that was in the world of sports. A little bit later on tonight, uh, we'll have uh, the Astros and the Diamondbacks. That'll be at 8. And then the Rangers playing at Seattle uh, tonight. And also bringing some humor to your day. Was it pretty big? Yeah. I mean, it was impressive. A, yeah. Was it fascinating? It was. I thought it was fascinating. It kind of smelled, but I mean. <laughs> Hear the show live weekday mornings at 6 on Double T 97.3 or on the Double T 97.3 mobile app. Hey, that's the way to get it going on this day. The work gets done. Hey, good morning, everybody. With Jamie Lent and Jeff McGuire, I'm Chuck Hines. We are the Morning Drive on Lubbock Sports Station, Double T 97.3 and Double T 97.3. Dot com. <clears throat> However long your drive is today, we hope you spend it with us as much as you can. Uh, we have you until 9 o'clock this morning, so if you get to the J-O-B and uh, want to listen to us, you certainly can. You can uh, maybe listen on your office radio or the Double T 97.3 mobile app. We come to you this morning from the First United Bank Double T 97.3 studio. Jamie's in the mobile studio today in Arlington. Jeff and I are here at the main branch. Look forward to hearing from you on the Yates Flooring Center chat line. Benchmark hotline is open as well. That number is 806-771-0973. Good morning, fellas. Good morning, Mr. Hines. <laughs> Mr. Hines, wow. Uh, man, you got to witness some history last night, Jamie. I think that is just awesome. As uh, Aaron Judge hit number 62 in his first at bat, he would bat one more time and then the Yankees would pull him. Uh, no, no surprise there that the Yankees would pull him. I, I don't even know if he plays today, although they've they've got the weekend off, so you almost kind of wonder, does he get in just a little bit to get to keep his rhythm going, or will they will the Yankees go play some you know games down in their you know farm league uh, this weekend to kind of keep their uh, keep their rhythm going? But how cool was that to be amongst the thirty eight thousand plus? Uh, there at uh, the ballpark in Arlington to to watch that. Yeah, it was it was pretty cool. It's kind of a, a, a funny atmosphere. It's I mean, really, for both games yesterday, it was like this feeling of you know everybody's just mingling and everybody's just moving around. And there's yeah, there's a baseball game going on. Well, oh wait, Aaron Judge is up. Everybody stands <laughs> up, gets their phones out, and it felt like nobody really cared who won the game, and nobody was really paying attention really to the rest of it. It was just about when Judge came to the plate and. Uh, it was just funny how the the disappointment from everyone, you know, both Yankee fan and Ranger fans, when when he didn't homer in any of those at bats, starting with with the first game of the doubleheader yesterday. So it was kind of a just a I don't know, it was just a, an odd feeling. And then, of course, once one once it happened, and you know, the first at bat of of game two, then it just kind of like, it was like really, really exciting. And then the kind of the air kind of went out of the place. You saw the attendance uh, go down a whole bunch. So it was, it was definitely interesting. 38,832 uh, for game two last night. That's the largest to watch a baseball game there at, uh, at the ballpark in uh, finishing up its, its third year. Of course, you know, they, they had a real challenge with, you know, the COVID year in 2020. Um, but still, I mean, that's uh, pretty cool. A guy named Corey Yeomans, a Ranger fan uh, who works in the financial industry, made the catch. There was another guy that tried to make the catch who tried to jump over the wall and catch it, I guess. Uh, but he did mm. not He did not get that ball. <clears throat> okay. It, it's funny. Once uh, I didn't think about it until, you know, I'm sitting down the third baseline um, not, not, not too incredibly far. Um, cause I'm, I'm down the left field line a bit in foul territory. So not too incredibly far from where the ball went, but obviously I'm in foul territory and, you know, I watch it. And once I see that it's in the crowd, I kind of lose track of that and really don't think about it much. And, um, we look back and watch judge around the, around the bases and see him celebrate with his team. And then, I'm kind of watching that. And then all of a sudden I hear this roar from the crowd 
back there in left field. And I'm like, what's, what's going on. And then I see them with security taking the guy out and mm-hmm. I'm like, Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> Histori- historic ball. I like completely forgot about that part of it, which is always, you know, somewhat interesting as who catches it and mm-hmm. all that. And I completely forgot about like paying attention to that. I was more paying attention to judge and the Yankees. And so anyway, it was, uh, it, it was, it was pretty cool. No, no doubt about it. I was, uh, it was pretty fun to be there. You know, uh, I was, uh, I was listening game one and I had just left a business and I'd gotten on the loop and was listening to Eric Nadell. And he was talking about, you know, if, if, uh, he gets on, there could be another at bat for, for judge in the ninth. And there was like a walk and you heard this like huge roar. <laughs> yes, roar. <laughs> because, roar. Because they knew the judge was going to get another at bat. And then he comes mm-hmm. up and uh, as, and then he, he like first pitch, I think, grounds out to short um, there yeah. in game one. Anyway, I thought I was I was hopeful uh, to be able to hear that. I, I, I did not. I, I was uh, at another event last night. So while you were. While you were watching Aaron Judge, I was watching JJ and Coco Mellon of uh, True Form uh, last night, and I had a, I had a thrilling time. I got to tell you, I had a blast last night. So you had a blast, yeah. I had a blast, and that's uh, that's awesome. You know what was interesting to me in listening to both the calls, Michael K on the Yankees uh, Television Yes Network, and then John Sterling uh, on the Yankees Radio Network. Both both ended their statements. Um, after the home run call with case closed. And I, I wondered, I have no idea if these guys, you know, you know, got together and said, Hey, let's do this or let's do this together. Or, or if it was just coincidence or, or whatnot, but I thought it was very, very interesting how they both did their traditional home run calls and then, you know, ended it with case closed. Okay. So case closed that he's the home run King, I guess for the American league or, you know, just, I mean, it it was just, but it was just interesting to me. I just thought, wow, either that's incredibly ironic or those two guys got together and said, Hey, let's do this together. You do what you do and I'll do what I do. And when you get all done case closed, because I mean, that's, that's not something that I would have necessarily thought of or that would, but I just thought it was, I just thought it was interesting. Um, more than more than anything else and and i you know i think this is this is part of what makes baseball i think a romantic sport in that you have historic numbers and you know i know it's not the major league record but it's the american league record and you know it's 61 years after roger maris did it 61 years so you can say whatever you want about you know bats and baseballs and steroids and things like that but it's been 61 years since somebody did that in the american league now, does this mean that the American League has bigger parks or better pitching or not as good of players or what? It doesn't matter. It's been 61 years since somebody did this in the American League, and I just, I, I'm just, I was fascinated by the by the chase, uh, and I, I think it's, I think it's cool, um, and uh, you know, congrats, congrats to him. And by by no stretch of the imagination am I a, am I a Yankee lover? I, I, I respect what they have done over the years. Um, and I, I just thought what he did last night was was cool. And then the way that he kind of handled it, the home run trot and kind of did about his business and his teammates were there and they celebrated and they moved on. Uh, yeah, that's kind of Aaron Judge. I mean, that's really, he's not a, he's, he's not a flashy guy. A lot of people don't like that, but that's kind of who he is. And um, he's not a great interview and people don't like that. But I mean, I, I, uh, I like how he handles himself. It's one of the reasons that, I really root for him, and uh, even in that moment, I, I felt like you know, head down around the bases, he did have a smile on his face, which was great. Uh, I thought it was hilarious how his mom didn't stand until it actually left the ballpark because she really just didn't believe it. <laughs> it's been a, been a long process for him to break the record, I guess. Getting your sports day started the right way. This is the Morning Drive podcast from Double T ninety seven three, breaking down the biggest games. If Texas Tech does not win the Big Twelve football conference, who are you rooting for to win the conference? If Tech does not win it this year, well, busting some chops along the way. I hold back on sending you stuff. I mean, I'm very, very, very judicious. We spend three hours a day, five right? days a week together. Why? Yeah. Do, why would yeah. we need to 
communicate during the weekends. <laughs> right, we save don't. it for the show. Well, yeah, we, say, we do. We save it for the show. The- Tune into the Morning Drive live weekdays from 6 to 9 on Lubbock Sports Station, Double T 97.3. Today's fifth day of October 2022. Time for this day in sports history. Here is Jeff McGuire. Let's start in 1908. Because Chicago White Sox pitcher Ed Walsh beats the Detroit Tigers 6-1. to one. This would be his 40th victory of the season mm-hmm. and forces an AL pennant race to the final day of the year. Wow. 1915, Detroit Tigers speedster Ty Cobb steals his 96th base of the season in a 5 to nothing loss to the Cleveland Indians. Strands as, uh, stands as a Major League Baseball record until 19. 19- 1962, when a guy named Murray Wills steals 104. And Murray Wills, his son, uh, Murray Bump, Wills. Sorry. Bump played for the Rangers. Bump. What a great name. Bump Wills. Yeah. 1941, Brooklyn ca- uh, Dodger catcher Mickey Owens drops a third strike, mm. and Tom Hendrick reaches first safely for the Yankees for a famous baseball World Series error that would have been the last out. Instead, the Yankees score four more and win seven to four and win the series four games to one. Yeah, that was no bueno. 1956, Chicago, uh, Chicago, uh, catcher Yogi Berra becomes the fourth New York Yankee to hit a baseball World Series grand slam in game two at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. Dodgers win the game, though, 13 to eight, but they would then lose the series overall four games to three. 1986, Rams running back Eric Dickerson runs for an NFL overtime record of 42 on a 42-yard touchdown as the Rams defeat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers 26 to 20 at Anaheim Stadium. The Big A. I remember when the Rams used to play there. That was pretty cool when the Rams played there. 1991, Fresno State ties the NCAA football record with 49 points in a quarter. Hmm. As they route New Mexico ninety-four to seventeen at Bulldog Stadium in Fresno, forty-nine points in one quarter. That's seven, crazy. seven possessions. I wonder if there were some defensive scores in there. I have no. Gosh, I, the, I, I need to know how. I need to know how many plays they ran offensively in that. I mean, because it feels like it would have had to have been big plays over and over again. What was the year on that again? Nineteen ninety-one. Yeah, I'm gonna guess there were no like. 14 play drives in there. <laughs> no, you know, yeah, no. <laughs> Not in any way, shape, or form. Uh, 2001, Barry Bonds hits his 71st and 72nd home runs in an 11-10 loss to the L.A. Dodgers at Pacific Bell Park. Breaks Mark McGuire's MLB season single re- home run record. I could not have said that worse. And in 2003... Kansas City wide receiver Dante Hall scores on a game-winning 93-yard punt return in the Chiefs' 24-23 victory versus the Denver Broncos at Arrowhead Stadium. Returns to score in an NFL record fourth straight game. That's impressive. I mean, that's like insanely impressive. It is National Apple Betty Day. What is that? Kind of like an uh, an apple, like it's a dessert. Obviously, um, it's a it's a, an apple Betty. I don't I don't know a better way to describe it. It's apple and cinnamon and pastry and awesome. It's also Rocky Mountain Oyster Day. I'm not. I'm, I'm out on that. Yeah, I kind of figured you would be. Happy birthday, Lucas White turns 28 today. So make sure everybody says happy birthday to him later today. Kate Winslet is 47, Travis Kelsey, 33, Neil deGrasse Tyson, 64, Brian Johnson from ACDC, 75, Steve Miller, 79, Grant Hill has a 50-burger today. Wow. Barry Switzer, 85, and a Mm. blast from the past for Rangers fans. Alexi Ogondo is 39 today. Mm. Alexi Ogondo is 39 The shortstop turned pitcher. Mm Mm-hmm. And on this day in 1892, the famous Dalton gang attempted the daring du- daylight robbery of two Coffeeville, Kansas banks at the same time. But if the gang members believed that their sheer audacity of their plan would bring them success, they were sadly mistaken. 
Instead, they were nearly all killed by the quick acting townspeople. Mm. And that is this dance sports history. But before Chuck gives us more updates on the Fresno game. <laughs> That's exactly right. It's uh, time for the word of the day. Tired of national radio contests, the other radio stations do. Where local listeners have little to no chance of actually winning. So are we. That's why Double T 97.3 has teamed up with the Home Zone, making your house a home. We're going to give away $10,000 in cold, hard cash. Probably won't just be in fives, tens, and twenties. They don't make a $10,000 bill anymore, so we'll write you a check. So listen every day at this time, plus at 845 and 445 during Tech Talk for the s- secret word. Then enter it to at uh, DoubleT97.3.com to be calm, to be qualified to win, and it will be given away on November the 18th. The more times you enter, the more chances you have to win. Today is Wednesday, October the 5th. The secret word at 645 is Pistons. Pistons, like Detroit Pistons. Pistons. P-I-S-T-O-N-S. Pistons. And that is your secret word at 651 this morning. Brought to you by the Home Zone, making your house a home. Uh, I cannot find a stat. Oh, Maybe I can. I'm looking for a box score for that day. It's uh, it's problematic, so I have not been able to find it. But Trent Dilfer was on that team, Jamie. Oh, yeah, he was a Fresno guy. Yep. Yeah. So um, I may have to do a little bit more research on that to try to get your, your uh, box score for 94-2. What was the final? 94 to 17 was the final. Man, that's crazy. Just absolutely crazy. Um, let's see here. Brown Betty is an apple crisp. Okay. As somebody says, uh, Maury Wills passed away a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I think I'd seen that as well. So that's, uh, that's too bad. We'll have high school fan zone tonight. Friendship and Lubbock Cooper coaches so will visit on the high school fan zone tonight. That'll be at 7 on 100.7 the score uh before that astros and the phillies uh will play that's a 240 game from minute made and about a 305 310 first pitch boy that'll be uh won't be a whole lot to that game jamie (laughs) neither one of those teams have anything to play for except for making sure nobody gets hurt uh as they get ready for uh, postseason play both those teams will be involved in that I thought all I think all major league games are starting at the same time today. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I think everybody's uh, yeah. everybody's an afternoon affair uh, today. Mm-hmm. So that allows the teams that are getting ready for the playoffs to um, to move ahead, and the teams that are done for the year are out of there so that they can get on the road to go over it is where where they're going to go. So that's. Uh, that's too bad uh, for uh, the Rangers who just now the now the deal will be okay. Um, who's going to be the manager and w- what kind of changes are going to be making? And what kind of acquisitions will they make and and all those all those kinds of things. That 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 to me is the that that becomes what's interesting more than anything else, right? Yeah, that's. I mean, those are questions that they're answering. Yeah, absolutely. That and some of the can, can some of their young players, including Josh Young, take a step forward next year. Yeah, but at least at least there's not any question about you know Josh Young and you know what's he uh, what's he going to do and you know how's that you know when's he going to come up? I mean those 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 questions have been those questions have been answered. Um, so it's uh, that's that's it for that. Uh, one thing that did happen uh, yesterday. Uh, at the uh, the ballpark in Arlington is uh, one of the uh, one of the Yankees hit a home run and got the ball back because it was his first ever. Your morning dose of coffee and sports. This is the Morning Drive podcast from Double T ninety seven three. Catch the show live weekdays from six to nine on Double T ninety seven three FM or on the Double T ninety seven three mobile app. Ask for your thoughts and comments on the Eighth Flooring Center chat line. Go to double t ninety seven three dot com for that. Or the mobile app. It's presented by Happy State Bank. Uh, all right, we get this. I know there is a lot of football to go, but if Tech can get things going, this could be the first time Tech could beat UT and OU in the same season. 
I was thinking about that the other day. Um, that's uh, that's a real possibility, given how Oklahoma is playing right now. Yeah, um, I guess. I guess I'll wait and see how Oklahoma's playing mm -hmm. when they get to us. Cause that's a long time from now, a long time from now, but um, that's crazy. We've since we've never beaten them both in the same year. I guess. I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, I guess either. it's, I guess it's believable sure. as both programs have been. Sure. Um, yeah. That'd be, that'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> be pretty sweet. <laughs> right. But I, I guess I expect Oklahoma to get it figured out. Maybe they're not at the top of the conference like we've always come to expect. Mm -hmm. But I guess I expect to see them play a lot better than yeah. than they they played last Saturday and maybe even the Saturday before. Uh here's some uh, disagreement on the Yates Flooring Center chat line. JL, I disagree wholeheartedly. Coaches and athletes want to go up against the best every week. We do not want to play little sisters of the poor, but we at times, because the administration schedules it, we need to donate to them so that they can survive in the athletic in their athletic department. And let's face it, to buy a win to get you closer to a bowl game. But when it comes to putting on the cleats, athletes and coaches want to go against the best. Good, better, ugly, I guarantee it. Okay. I don't know if that person's I mean, a football player or, a, you know, one of the coaches or something like that, but wouldn't use the I word think those, we. I think those coaches are uh, pretty um, pretty strong in their desire to win enough games to uh, keep getting paid. Yes, especially with what's coaches. been going on. Yeah. Um, you You schedule games like Murray State to get some things figured out to get young players some experience, you know, all of the above, but you also schedule them to help you get a bowl, get mm -hmm. to a bowl game right? and help you get some confidence in the season. And I mean, you don't want the rigors of playing. You don't want to play 12 straight conference games where you're playing great teams. that are going to beat yourself up. You need, you know, a little bit of a let up here and there. And I get the thought that players want to play good teams and all that good stuff. But I think there's plenty to gain when you're talking about playing patsies and non-conference and, sure. and that kind of thing. Um, and, and that's why you do it. And, um, but, but I, I, I totally get an attitude of that. Hey, bring it on. Who's next? Let's mm -hmm. go. We've got this. We're not going to be like, man, we got another tough team this week. Um, oh, I totally man. get that. <laughs> I told I I mean I, I I completely agree with that, but mm -hmm. I, I I don't think coaches want to play a ranked team every week. No, I, I players players maybe. Yeah. Coaches, no way. Yeah. There's uh, a lot to gain by having some easy teams on your schedule. Sure. You gotta it helps you kind of figure things out a little bit. And I think you said the most important thing at the beginning. Uh these coaches are trying to figure out a way to um, win enough games to keep their jobs so that they can get up the hill far enough so that they can get in better players, bigger recruits, get their program in place, sustain themselves. Sure. Because See, that's that's another one that you brought. That's a good point right there, Chuck. More wins because we know winning breeds winning. More wins gets you in the attention of, of recruits and all that kind of stuff. So you've got to get yourself to a program that's going to bowl games consistently and winning a bunch of games. So. Mm -hmm. Kids, kids can think, yeah, uh, I want to go there because they win a lot and we go to good bowl games and all that. We've yeah. cr created this fun atmosphere. All right. Uh, coach mm -hmm. Joe McGuire is in his first year as the head coach at Texas Tech. He was asked uh, the other day what he has learned since week one. I just really try to concentrate on keeping uh, the main thing, the main thing, and continually um, try to make it simple. This is the message. This is what we're going to do. You know, I think – uh, so many coaches, you know, knee jerk and come up with all these little phrases every single week. And then the players are like, well, well what is it, coach? Is it are we going to start fast or is it to get it to the fourth quarter? Or is it so what you know, what we try to do is just keep this is who we are and and keep building that program, you know, um, and not making excuses that this is year one. I mean, me saying that sounds like that, but not man. My job is to try to find a way to win games. My job is 
to try to find a way to be better in the offensive line. My job is to find a way, way to, to protect you know, Donovan better and find a way to run the football better. And, and um, you know, this is they're, they're coming out and they're practicing every week. They're practicing extremely hard. And, you know, I said it yesterday. I mean, it's, it's funny what a difference a week makes. You know, I said, everybody, you walked around uh, the campus all week long and everybody patted you on the back. And now you're going to brace a lot of hate for uh, getting beat by a really good football team in K-State at their place, you know. And so it's just a mixture of us all learning that that's just the – the, the nature of, of what we do and and really just concentrating on the people in the room and us getting better as a group and representing Texas Tech. So Joey McGuire. Now, he did bring up something with regard to the offensive line. Uh, Coach McGuire was asked, could we see changes at left tackle? Because let's face it, Caleb Rogers struggled um, against Kansas State. Uh, he wasn't the only one. Um, there was plenty of struggle uh, on that offensive side along the line and, of course, at quarterback as well, all leading up to this where he was asked, could we see some changes at left tackle? Yeah, we are. Um, we bumped uh, Ty Buchanan over to left tackle to back him up, um, and we'll kind of see how those two, you know, go. It's going to be a little bit strange for Ty. He's never played left tackle, but he's, you know, he's really athletic, and, um, you know, he was a guy that – we thought we'd push Monroe uh, for playing time, and Rose, you know, played um, better um, and practiced better. So he's a guy that's been starting, but we're moving him over to kind of, you know, see how he looks, um, you know, and and some of it, uh, you know, is making sure that, you know, 91 is going to play in the NFL, you know, and um, we got to. We've got to do a good job. Of whether it's we're sliding to him, you turn around this week, man. They got, they got five or six guys that can flat out rush the passer. I mean, it doesn't get any easier. We turn around and you got you go to West Virginia. They got a guy, probably multiple guys, but I know they got one guy that's been there a long time that's disrupted. Then we play Baylor and they've got four or five guys that are going to play in the NFL. I mean, you say whatever you want about. Uh, different conferences that are really good. I just know that the Big 12 is as good as any conference. I mean, again, there's a lot of people that hang their hat on one or two teams in other conferences. And and uh, then you see at the end of the year in bowl games and, and non-conference games that the Big 12 can hold their own with anybody. So they're going to create a little uh, competitiveness there at uh, left, left tackle. Um with uh, Ty Buchanan getting a bump behind Caleb Rogers, and that'd probably be some rotation there. But uh, I thought that was a an interesting comment from uh, the head coach Jamie. Yeah, I think uh, anytime you're struggling along the offensive line, you're always trying to, or really anywhere, you're always trying to find something maybe to to spark the team or find a, a chemistry that will work a little bit better. You know, you talked before the season started about it's not about having the best left tackle or right tackle or right guard. It's about having the best five offensive linemen. So they're, you know, he expects those guys to be able to move around a little bit. And so I'm sure he's just trying to figure out a group of five. That's going to be the best together. Uh, we'll get to this, but he, he, he was asked, uh, Jeff asked this question. I thought it was a good question. We'll get it from both coach Kitley and from coach McGuire about the tight end position and the feast or famine, uh, aspect of that, um, We'll get to, get to that just after eight with Coach McGuire. But one thing that he said about Henry Teeter, who only got four snaps, he was asked about that, and he said that that's due to the growth of Mason Tharp. You're tuned in to the Morning Drive podcast from Double T 97.3, recapping the night that was in the world of sports. That's not to say that they don't respect the run game that you have, but you're talking about one quarterback leading the, the conference in passing so far this year. And remember, he didn't start the first game. All right. He still played a lot, though. And also bringing some humor to your day. I, d- I just don't want to disappoint you. I just, <laughs> as much as I disappoint you, I don't want to disappoint you in some things that you expect from me. Hear the show live weekday mornings at 6 on Double T 97.3 or on the Double T 97.3 mobile app. Jamie's question of the day on Double T 97.3 is presented by Bizarre Solutions. Call them today for a free cybersecurity audit. All right, 7.31 this morning on the morning drive. Time for our question of the day from Jamie. What you got for us? All right, Chuck, I want you to look at the football schedule the rest of the way. You too, Jeff, Mm -hmm. and our fine listening audience. Fine listening audience. Look at the schedule the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. Just kind of scrap what you had at the beginning of the season. 
Mm -hmm. I want you to look at the rest of the way and tell me what you think the schedule will be for the Red Raiders for the remaining seven games. Okay, so uh, here's what you've got. You've got um, Oklahoma State, West Virginia, Baylor at TCU, Kansas at home, at Iowa State, Oklahoma at home. Currently, the Red Raiders are three and two. Uh, they've won their home games, lost their road games. I don't think you're going to win all your home games. Um, I don't think you're going to lose all your road games. Uh, so give me a win over West Virginia, a win at TCU, a win at home against Kansas, I'll take that back. I'm going to have a loss at TCU, a win at Iowa State. So give me a win over Kansas, win over Iowa State, and then the win over West Virginia uh, to get you to six. You'll finish six and six. So you go, you go three and four down the stretch. Okay. Okay. So, all right, go ahead, Jeff. Loss at Oklahoma State. Win against West Virginia. Loss against Baylor, although I could see that one going either way. In fact, I could put Baylor, TCU, and Iowa State, all three of those, as win or lose games. And that's the hard part in this, is figuring out where the... We don't know enough about the conference yet. Like, is TCU a great team? Mm -hmm. Is is Kansas? Kansas hasn't played anybody yet, but they are undefeated. There, there's something that goes with that. Mm -hmm. Are they sure. the sure. first year under Cliff Kingsbury uh, seven and zero team? Right. Or are they, you know, just a team that has figured them some some things out in the off season? I think they're uh, closer uh, to that. Probably a combination of both. It, yeah. Right, and but that doesn't mean I like that game. I like it at home better than not, but it's also the game that you, yeah. the fan base looks at and says, you should win this game. It's Kansas. Mm -hmm. But this is not the Kansas of three years ago. They're playing good football. Um, I'm not. The nightmares of Ames, Iowa, I can't call that a win. I could see Tech winning, but I can't call that a win. And then at home versus Oklahoma, which Oklahoma shows up? If this was this week, I'd feel much better about that game. I would pick a win this week if it was against Oklahoma this week. You would. It, but it's Oklahoma State this week. Okay. Oklahoma at the end of the year where they could be needing that if they go on a run to get in the Big 12 championship game or get into a bowl game. I hate that game at the end of the year. So I'm calling that a loss. So I guess I'm right there with Chuck in that three and two on the No, three and three and four. Three and four. To finish the year, that that math doesn't work in my head all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, one. Yeah, I guess three and four on the, to end the year. But I don't feel good about it in any way, shape, or form. So I, d I definitely don't feel good about your starter and your finisher, Oklahoma State and Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Okay, Because I think Oklahoma is a much better team than what they showed last week. And I think we'll we'll see that. I would not want to do want to play Oklahoma this Saturday because I would think they'd be pretty fired up and embarrassed in their yeah. performance last week. So I I gotta believe that that will be a fired up team. The other five, man, um, I think I feel the best about West Virginia at home. Um, probably second on the list would be. And Jeff makes sense. I know there's been struggles in Ames, but. Uh, from what I saw from Iowa State last weekend, that that was that was not good. I you mean, talk about a team that's good. got problems with their yeah. with their kicker. Uh, your kicker quarterback play was not good at all. Uh, penalties killed them. They just don't look like a good football team. Um, and then Kansas right behind them as far as confidence level. I definitely, man, that Baylor game at home, it just feels like we'll have an awesome crowd. It feels like it'll be a similar feel to what we had against Texas where, you know, they're the favored team and, and all that good stuff. But playing at home, the atmosphere will be great. And I think our players will be fired up for that one. 
Uh, and so I think, I mean, if I'm just looking at it on paper, I think Baylor's a better team, but I think we'll have a good chance in that game. And then TCU won, man, I've gone from feeling like they were going to be one of the worst teams in the league to seeing what happened last week and, and just not knowing anymore. So uh, that one seems tougher, but I, I think, I think I feel like you're going to get four. Four. Okay. I, I think you're going to get four. I think you're going to get four and and end up with with seven wins. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I got a prediction off my line that Kansas loses their next seven, which they could do. Oh, they no. did. They did that in 2009. They won their first five and then lost their last seven, and Mangino got fired. That's not going to happen. Probably the, not. Gonna Kansas happen. Kansas is better than that. Their defense is solid and their mm-hmm. offense is good enough. They'll they'll get somebody. Uh. The Bobby Hot Dog says he'll take probably a, sh- a probably a couple. Bobby Hot Dog says he'll take a shot of the Kool Aid and he'll say eight and four for the Red Raiders. Wow, it's only two losses. That's that's uh, five and two down the stretch. Uh, do you guys yeah. say three and four because at this point you're just praying for a bowl game? No, I I think this is what we believe, right? Right, this is what we what we believe. I mean, like I said, those three games you could win all three of them. Mm-hmm. You could also lose all three of those games. And there's a there's a. Part- I don't think you should pray for sports things to happen. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> probably. Probably. Can I really hope? Can I really hope? Is that better, different than praying? Probably better. Better things to <laughs> better things to pray for, right? That's kind of what I feel like. Yeah. He's got more important things to deal with. So world peace. I feel world like hunger. that. I feel like that would be bring bad luck to your program if you do that. Yeah. Yeah. You're probably. You're mm-hmm. probably right. Now, if you're mm-hmm. now if you're under ten and you've got some sports heroes out there, then probably that those are probably just saying a prayer. If you're under under twelve, is probably good. Would yeah, you, would I you mean, agree with that? Shoot. Yeah, just get it started just any get, way you want, just right? Get it, just, just get, get, get a relationship started one way or the right. other. Right. You can, you can get, get, it, get, get in the get in the habit. Get in the habit. I mean. <laughs> There's part of me that thinks that, you know, that there'll be a emotion filled crowd with Baylor because it's Baylor and Patrick Mahomes is going in the ring of honor. And, you know, I don't know. Does that, does that, does that bring any juice to it? Um, you know, you, you look at, you look at the Iowa state team. Okay. I think Kansas has got a pretty good quarterback and their defense shut him down in the second half. They only had, they only had their 14 points on Saturday and all of them were scored in the first half. So you know what does that say? And I and I think Oklahoma is a game that you could win, depending on where they are. I mean, have they checked out? Right? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I just have a hard time believing they're, that they're this bad. Uh, There's this, just too much talent there. Yeah, this from Bullfighter. He says, "Drink the JL juice. Hope we get to seven. <laughs> the JL juice. That's um, Bullfighter." It's uh, it's it's pretty tame. You can, it's pretty you can tame. get that in a green bottle. In any store. <laughs> you sure you sure can. Uh, this I agree, Chuck. TCU may be very good based on Oklahoma. You know they might be. I just I don't know. I I don't, they look they sure did look the part. And I also when their quarterbacks running like he did last week, it sure scares you mm-hmm. against the Red Raiders because you're like, uh, well, we kind of struggled stopping a purple quarterback last week. Your morning blend of sports. K State is uh, coming off a big win over Oklahoma. Of course, the Red Raiders off their 37-34 overtime win over number 22 Texas. And humor. I'm sure to tell them that you you suggested that. <laughs> And of course, they got a big laugh. This is the Morning Drive podcast from Double T 97.3. Catch the show live weekdays from 6 to 9 on Double T 97.3 FM or on the Double T 97.3 mobile app. Now joined to the Benchmark Hotline by the head coach of the Lady Raiders, Krista Gerlich. Good morning, coach. Good morning. How are you guys? We are awesome and uh, getting ready for some hoops. It's crazy as we've turned the calendar. Then you start thinking about, okay, when does uh, the Lady Raiders season and Red Raiders season begin? And for you... Uh, November the 1st, an exhibition game against Midwestern State. You return seven, and you have seven new. Um, let's talk about a couple of the returners first with um, with Bree Scott uh, coming back in and hopefully will be healthy, and uh, also Bryn Gerlich, uh, who also will be you know one of your top returning point scorers from a year ago, and, and uh, both those girls will give you some leadership, won't they? Absolutely, yes. Um, we certainly are hopeful that Bree can have a full season healthy. Um, she went through a lot of 
um, you know, things this, this past spring and summer to try to get that way. She's had surgery on her foot and, and has, has been doing a lot of rehab throughout the summer. Um, went to Greece with us but did not play to be able to uh, make sure and ensure that it would, uh, you know, stay healthy and continue to to thrive on that. But obviously expecting some big things from her. Um, and then, uh, yeah, then Bren coming back in and just understanding our, our system and, you know, being able to, she's led us in assists and, and been fourth in the Big 12 um, last year in assists and assist to turnover ratio. She has a chance to really kind of hold us together and, and help our young kids um, in a leadership role. Uh, one other, two others that are coming back that didn't play a great deal, but I, th- I think have a lot of potential. Lana Wenger and Saga Ukanen. Uh, speak, speak about both those players for you, Coach. Yeah, they both um, had a great summer as well. You know, both of them had opportunities to go back um, home during the summer and play for their FIBA teams, but there was a lot that went into that, and they were going to miss the majority of the summer. And both of them um, – knew that they could have that opportunity to do that later in their career. And they knew that this summer would be really important for them and really crucial for their development to be able to get on the floor. And so I'm really proud of the progress both of them have made. Saga works extremely hard and uh, is, pre- is is sneaky athletic. Like she, <laughs> like she can really run and she can jump pretty well, and but, but uh, really sneaky when it comes to that. Um, and has really shot the ball well this, this off season. And then Lana has just come – so far like I'm so excited about what she's doing for us and um, just a year of experience of playing college ball and playing again you know she missed her senior season because of COVID in California so it's literally been two years since she's played and she had a great spring um great she probably was the most impressive as far as like a surprise for us or most improved if you will um in Greece and I thought that she just really was active on the boards is using her athleticism to run the floor really well. Um, I'm excited about what she's going to bring um, to the table this year. And then uh, a couple of uh, new players that are, that are coming in. I'm, I'm real excited to see what Bailey Maupin's going to be able to do for you. The freshman from Groover, highly recruited, big shooter for you, and uh, could, could really add a lot to this team. No doubt, no doubt. And I've been um, extremely excited about her and very impressed. Um, I mean, I knew she was going to come in and, and really be a great player for us over the next four years, but it's been incredible to watch what an impact she's already had on our team. Um, her mindset is just elite. Um, it's just different. And she she plays that way. She's not intimidated at all. You know, the only thing that maybe even hints that she's a freshman is just her um, is just her strength, you know, because she just hasn't been in the weight room in the college setting in a while. But um, but she's not going to she's not going to back down. That's for sure. (laughs) She's going to go right at you. But, yeah, she she could she really has a chance to be special. And I don't want to put too much pressure on her as a freshman. But at the same time, I think that's what she wants is to be um, have expectations and to to know that um, she can impact us very, very early. All right, one one more thing before, and then I want to ask you about Greece a little bit. Um, two other players, and then I want to get to a coach. But uh, Jasmine, excuse me, Katie Farrell, who played for you at UT Arlington, comes in as a grad transfer. I think she's going to add a lot of leadership and, and toughness. And then Kyla Freelon uh, from Denver. She's six one, but boy, her legs are like seven feet. Coach. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Well, so Kyla, yes, freshman coming in, very, very, very talented, probably the best athlete that we've had um, on our roster the past three years. Um, I, I keep thinking Wes Kitley's going to come talk to me about her running in the spring for mm-hmm. him, and I would not be opposed to that because she's just an amazing um, athlete. But she's going to just develop and develop and develop because she, again, needs strength and experience. But um, the athleticism that she can play with and how hard she plays and how um, eager she is to learn is second to none. And I'm I'm so excited. She's going to be a sleeper for sure. She'll, she'll shock the Big 12, I think. Um, and then Katie Farrell, um, you know, you're not supposed to have favorites, but she's one of my all-time favorite players um, just because of her toughness, um, her IQ, and her ability to um, just make everyone around her better. I mean, she can find somebody open. She will deliver a pass before that person even knows they're open. And uh, she's just going to add something to our team that we just haven't had in in the full court sense. Like, she can find people over the top of presses and in transition. 
are just really, really smart, and she has every one of her teammates back. So she's going to just provide a toughness for us that and a grittiness that, that we've been missing, no doubt. So I'm, I'm excited about that. And, and I, I would be uh, remiss to not let you talk about um, both Jasmines that are coming in, Jasmine yeah. Schaefer and Jasmine Lewis. They both are just bringing some things that we haven't had in the past. Jasmine Lewis's size um, is incredible, and and she has really great touch around the basket. And then also um, Jasmine Shavers is just an elite scorer, and so I think she's really going to be fun to watch. Um, and I know we've missed them. You know, we haven't even talked about Ella, and Ella's Ella's excited about having her playing her sixth year of college basketball. <laughs> well, and the thing so, the thing about Shavers is she played at Mississippi State. She's been to a Final Four, and the thing about Lewis is she played at Houston and she's got six, four in the size. Um, okay. So coach Greece, um, what was the best thing you guys did and then how did it help your team? Well, the best thing that we did is we got to practice 10 days before we left to be quite honest. Um, I mean, we got 10 full practice days and I, we made them, uh, we made them super hard. I, I really reached out to a lot of, of my colleagues and said, Hey, we're going on this trip. You know, I have a new program. Um, what, what is the best thing that I can do? And they said, work their tails off for 10 days and then, um, and then go and really enjoy the experience and play basketball, you know, and have fun. And we did exactly that. We had two a days, um, for those 10 days, um, we made it like a boot camp. Um, I mean, they, they, they were, it was tough, you know, in July to be having two a days and having really long days. There's no hourly limits <laughs> and I didn't kill them by any means, but at the same time we made it tough on them. And so we got tougher as a team um, during those 10 days. And then when we got over to Greece, just the experience and the memories that you make together, but we also got to win together. Um, and that was really, really important for this group of girls. So what was like the, Okay, this is like shallow into the pool stuff, coach, but like the fun the fun aspect of it. Like what was the what was the oh number gosh. one fun thing that you guys did, do you think? Oh, I don't even know if there was one, but um obviously we went on a boat ride, um, only our travel party. So there was about forty of us on this private boat and we went out in the Aegean Sea and um they had a chef on board that created, we all agree, was the best meal we had over there the entire time. And he created it while on board this this boat. Like, incredible. The spread was just incredible. And we went over to um, Pistachio Island, which um, I bought so many different types of pistachios over there, like pistachio brittle and pistachio um, uh, like peanut butter kind of thing, or pistachio butter is basically what it was. Um, and we stayed a little while there. Then we got back on the boat and we went over to another island, but we didn't get on the island. We anchored out and the girls got to get in the water and swim. And I mean, you could see the color of their toenail polish. The water was so clear. Um, and then, you know, and then we came back. And, and so that was one of the highlights, I think, of the girls, because it was just us out there in the middle of the sea on the other side of the world. And so that was super fun. The beach um, was incredible when we went to Creek uh, the island of Crete, um, that entire experience, the villages on that island were just eye-opening um, and just you felt like you were back in time. So those, it just, I mean, I could go on and on. There were so many things what, that we did that you, was so much fun. You can't because we're out of time. But <laughs> <laughs> you got to give me more time. Like, it's just not enough time. Well, listen, thanks. And we want everybody to, to join the Lady Raiders and uh, watch some games at United Supermarkets Arena this year. And, uh, yes, come and out, buy some tickets. Come out and come out and see them. And of course, uh, Fink and I'll have the broadcast for you. Uh, we didn't get to go Absolutely. to Greece, but we, you know, maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> Are you pouting about that? No, it sounds not at like all. you're pouting about not, that. Not at all. Not at all. I'm glad you guys had a great time. That's uh, Coach Christy Gerlich here with us on the Benchmark Hotline. You've been listening to the Morning Drive podcast from Double T 97.3. For more from Lubbock Sports Station, go to double T 973com